Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Oh, come on, guys. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is a broadcast. I know you guys don't want to be here. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulim kareem. Amma ba'd. Subhanaka la ilmalana illa ma'allamtana inna ka anta ladimul hakeem. Rabbi shahli sadri. Wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqdata min lisani yafkahu qawli. Rabbi yassir wa la tuassir wa tammimhu lana bil khayr. Ya fattahu, ya fattahu, ya fattah. Respected brothers and elders, mothers and sisters in Islam and my youngsters, it's an honor for me to be here. Alhamdulillah, Pathway to Jannah is an amazing program for many years. How many of you have been to this program before, Pathway to Jannah, right? You guys been here before? MashaAllah, that's amazing. Some of you are your first time, who's first time? Okay, first time, great. So what happens is usually over the course of this weekend, we gathered with, with, with some of our local scholars and people who we know around uh, and they come in and they stay with us and we sit and we listen to different things and different topics uh, and, there, and then there's always a set theme and who knows what a theme is? What do you mean by a theme? Like if there's a theme to a program, what does that actually mean? I want it to be a little bit more interactive. What does it mean to have a theme? Huh? That's right. So there's an overall message. Like for example, you spend, you invest 24 hours, 48 hours, you're here for two days. What do you want to take back, right? So all of us, we really need to make sure that we really take back something beneficial. And I was actually talking to a group of young kids last week in my own community. And I said, look, 2020 just started, right? Do you know what date is today? What's it's the 11th, right? Wow, it's 11th already. We just started it, but it's already 11 days, right? That's, that's very quick. So I was asking these youngsters and I said, look, all of us have 52 weeks, most likely. All of us have 24 hours a day. All of us have 365 days. But why do certain people get to do more than the other? Meaning you must know a lot of people as your own friends who are able to do much more than you in a year than someone else or your own self. Why do you feel that there are certain people who are able to maximize their time than the others? Yes, please. What? It's how we use our time. That's great. It's how we use our time. So certain people are able to maximize their time than the others because that's they know how to use their time. What else, guys? What do you think allow certain people to be more productive than the other even though we have the same days, the same hours, the same seconds, the same minutes. What allows someone to actually benefit the others? What, what else? What do you guys think? Come on guys, don't be shy. What do you think? So he said utilize our time properly. What else? What do you guys think? Come on. The opportunities, they, they, they don't delay for the opportunities, right? If something comes up, they take it, right? Sometimes you would regret, I wish I would have taken that opportunity. So when, when an opportunity arises, they don't wait, right? So take, take the opportunity. They use their time properly. What else? What can make, what can allow you to maximize your time in your life? That's, that's what I want to ask you. What do you think that you can maximize your time in 2020? Yes. Determination, subhanAllah, that's so important. My khutbah yesterday when I was speaking in the masjid was that you need to be motivated enough to rise and then you need to have continuous habit in order to make sure that you do it consistently. So determination is something that will allow you to do something. If you're not determined enough, it's not going to happen. Motivation is the first step for you to do something. If you're not determined, if you're not motivated enough, it's not going to happen. The most difficult tasks become easy when you're determined and motivated that I got to get it done. For example, a person says, you know what, I'm going to start eating healthy in 2020. If you're not determined enough, if you're not motivated enough, if you don't feel that's worth enough, you're never going to do it. And on the other side, you may know it's good, but you need that power inside. It's something has to allow you. That's why I, I, I gave this example too. And I said, I asked a kid, not a kid, a, a young adult. He was in the gym. How many of you have been to a gym? Like, where, where, okay, good. 
guys never been to a gym? Okay. So you have seen a gym in a picture or something? Like you never walked inside. Do you know what happens in a gym? Like all the good stuff. So a, a guy was picking up weights. Who knows what's a bench press? You guys don't want to Okay, good. So bench press is that you have a little bench and you put, put your chest down and there's a bar on top of your head and you try picking up this weight. And this weight depends if it's free weight or it's machine weight, anywhere in like this. So this guy was doing about 200 pounds. Is that okay, right? For you guys, like 200 pounds is pretty okay. So this guy was doing 200 pounds. I asked the guy and I said, you know what, I'm gonna be a little blunt, but look, for us to pick up these 200 pounds right now in the gym is so easy because we feel that pump, we feel that power. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. This session is not sponsored by Starbucks. No, this is just, <laughs> it's just a pump. It's not sponsored by, please. Jazakallah khair, brother. Thank you, may Allah reward you and bless you and increase for you. Protect you and your family, inshallah, and keep the deen alive. So now the question is, is that I told, look, it's so easy for you to, to pump up 200 pounds in the gym, but why is it so difficult for that same person to pick up the five pound blanket on your face at the time of Fajr? Why is it so hard, right? Think about it. Meaning, are we not motivated enough? Is it, is it, is it, are we not determined enough as the brother mentioned? Yes. Shaitan, okay, we blame everything on Shaitan, right? Shaitan is a bad guy in every single picture. What about me? What about myself and our own self, right? Our nafs? So look, guys, I want to go back to what the brother mentioned. He said, we need to be determined enough in order to make a decision. So for example, if we're able to pick up 200 pounds in a gym, what stops us from picking up the five pounds off of our face in a gym? There is something that is going on in my body that I must realize that I may not be doing it right, right? We need to make sure that we understand that there is something that is not right. There is something that is not correct. What allows me to be on, can I say it, like on Netflix for hours, but doesn't allow me to be in the Quran for even 10 minutes. What allows me to hold my phone and be on social media for hours, and does not allow me to do the tasbih of Allah for a few seconds. Meaning, there's a question that I want to ask myself. I don't want to ask you, I'm asking myself that what is it that's not allowing us to make these decisions in our lives? So going back to what I said was, how do we maximize our time? There are a lot of people who want to do a lot of things in life, but we are not able to maximize our time. So what are some of the key factors in order to understand that we need to maximize our time. Guys, so you mentioned determination. You said opportunity. You said what? In the beginning, that they use their time properly, right? They use their time properly. What else? How, what else do you think? I, I want some participation, some way that we feel that, you know what, I want to be a part of this. How do I maximize my time? Because if we don't realize the importance of time now, we're really not going to take anything back. Time is gonna fly. You must have heard this so many times that a person said my 2020 goals are the ones that I posted in 2019, which I thought about in 2018, which I was thinking from 2017, which never worked out, right? So it's all these things that continuously go forward, move on, move on, but subhanAllah, they never come true. So now guys, really, that's my thing. How do you feel? Well, how, how else do you think that we can really move forward and maximize our time? Anyone else? Come on, guys. No one? SubhanAllah, thank you so much. May Allah reward you and bless you. That's great. Constant self-evaluation. Every single day you need to be determined and you need to evaluate yourself. Do you know that our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, وسلم, would evaluate himself every single day? He would evaluate himself every single day to see what he had done, right? How many of us every single day actually gauge ourselves in the evening and see, you know what, how much good did I do and how much bad did I do, right? None of us actually. Few of us would sit down. If you have a business or if you have some organizational work or something like that, and if a person was to, uh, you know, run a proper business, what do you do, right? 
Does anyone know what do you do? What do you do at the end of the day when your business closes? Who knows? What do you do when your business closes at the end of the day? Yes. You count your profit, mashallah. That's good. You're going to be a great help for your dad, bro. I'm telling you, mashallah. So at the end of the at the end of the day of your business, you count your profit. What else? What else do you do? Anyone? Even the adults can join in, man. Don't worry about it. So most likely that's what the brother mentioned, right? That we, we, we count our profits and we see how our day went. Rasulullah sallallahu taught us this every single day, right? That every single day when you're about to take break and you're about to sleep and you're about to lay down, take evaluation of how your day has been, right? Have your good deeds been more about? Hassan al-Basri, rahmatullahi a great scholar of his time, said something so beautiful. He said, you know, a day of Eid, this paper has been going around, brother. Is, is that okay? I was just just saying that you have non if you have non Muslims are listening in and some of the terminology. Can you just like you know say what? A, sure. You know? why, why don't you tell me the paper going around there? Yeah, tell me. Send the paper to me, brother. Don't worry about it. The, the whole crowd read it except for me. And none of them, none of them are saying anything. It is like it reminds me of my school time when we used to pass the the, the papers around the kids and teachers never knew. So, sure, I'll I'll, I'll make sure. sure. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone got any concerns? Finally gave it to the right person. But... <clears throat> All right. Thank you. I'll make sure I do that. So, <clears throat> so brothers and sisters, we go back to the point, <clears throat> and I apologize for my, uh, you know, stuff as well that I can't speak properly because of <clears> throat issues. But again, maximizing our time. So many of us have time. So many of us have time. But how do I maximize my time? The Prophet, peace be upon him, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, وسلم, mentioned that there are two blessings of God, the Lord Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which many people reject or many people do not care for. And so many of them have it. And it's your health and it's your time. The health and the time that you have been given is one of the greatest bounties and blessings of God in your life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The greatest of the blessings and bounty. And if you really look into the Quran, and I really speak to the youth and the youngsters, the related to time is because I know how much time you're wasting every day. I remember one day I forgot my phone. I, I left my house, I forgot my phone, I got to the place where I had to go, I had to be there for a few hours, and I promise I tell you this, this was the longest day I had in many, many years. It just felt like the longest day of my life. Why? You know why? Tell me guys, any of the youngsters? Why did it feel like such a long day? Yes. Yeah. So I wasn't actually on my phone. And I wasn't actually like just being on the phone and not doing anything which was really not productive, right? And I felt that for my own self. And for all of us we realize that we really have a lot of time that Allah has given us. And, and Allah meaning the, for the brothers and sisters who are not Muslim listening to us, Allah what I refer to means God Almighty. And the time that He has given us is so important and so valuable that once it's gone, it's gone, right? If you remember, I mentioned this in this pathway to Jannah a few years ago. I said the value of time is different for different people. Everyone values time according to the way they look at time. So for example, what is the value of one year? It's 365 days for many of us. For many of us, we think that this year uh, I'm just going to finish my college or someone will say I'll finish my high school or someone will say I'll go through my elementary school or someone said I'll finish fifth grade or sixth grade meaning that's that's what a year is for us many of us I'll finish my master's I'll finish my PhD I'll get a job I, meaning everyone considers things according to what they have a dream for if you really want to know the value of one year you ask a person who actually failed the grade and he or she has to repeat that entire year for themselves. The way that they will tell you what one year is, no one else can. 
If you want to know the value of one month, right? For many of us, it's just 30 days. January is going, it's going to finish, it's going to be done very soon. If you want to know the value of one month, you ask a mother who gave birth to a premature baby. A child who was born four weeks earlier than they were supposed to. This child is too weak. The mother has to care for this child's every single breath. This child is unable to be that child that a mom and dad had really anticipated and dreamt for. And that one month changed their entire life. For what that mother and father knows about that one month, none of us can ever know the value of that one month. The, the value that they consider of that one month, no one else knows. If you want to know the value of one week, you ask a person who writes a weekly news editor, who has something to publish every week. What's one week to him or her? No, none of us can ever know what one week means. For us, it just comes and goes. For young kids, we just wait for the weekend, school finishes, and that's it. For many of us, we really don't realize what is the value of the week of what a weekly news editor knows. For some of you who are older will understand this a little bit better. <coughs> Elder people will. If you want to know the value of a single day, if you want to know the value of a single day, you ask a daily wage labor worker who works every day to earn money, and if he or she does not earn anything, they bring nothing back home. What one day means to them, none of us can ever else know. You want to know the value of one hour? You ask a friend who has been waiting for a friend for an hour what one hour means. You want to know the value of one minute? You ask a person who missed the train, who missed the bus, who missed the, who missed the ride, of what, what one minute means for them? I wish it was only a minute. You want to know the value of a second? You ask a person who missed an accident. It was the blink of an eye. Something happened and it was just a second that, that saved their lives. I know people who are thankful for a second that it happened and they, they weren't there. Or something happened and, and the Lord changed it. It was only a second that changed everything in their life. For what they value, that one second, none of us can ever know. For us, many seconds already passed. Have you ever thought that someone would value a millisecond? Do you know a millisecond is not even a portion of, like, smallest portion of a second. But there are people who value a millisecond. And you know who values a millisecond? It's a person who runs Olympics or who participates in Olympics every four years. And now he or she is only a millisecond short or less than someone else. And they lost the competition. They lost the race. 100 meters, 200 meters. They lost the race. Why? Because they were only a millisecond shorter than someone else. And because of this one millisecond, what happened? He or she is never standing on the top podium. Nor they get the gold medal. Nor their flag is raising high. Nor the national anthem is playing. Meaning now all of the efforts that he or she had put is gone because of one millisecond. And what he or she knows about that millisecond, all of us could never know why because the pain he or she feels because of the loss of that millisecond. Brothers and sisters, for a believer, even a millisecond is too much. Because for us as believers, every single second of our life, a millisecond of our life, is connected to the eternal life of Allah. If the hereafter was going to end one day, it would be okay to do whatever you want. But if Akhara is meant to be forever, imagine forever, right? That's not even possible in our minds to even imagine something forever. Imagine that Jannah and paradise and goodness forever, then that really means that we need to maximize the time that we have. All of us have a specific time. Our deaths are known to our Creator before our death, our, our, our lives. Have you ever thought about this ayah of the Qur'an? And I want you to think about this. There's a surah of the Qur'an that the Prophet ﷺ said, if you recite every single night, you will not be punished in the grave. Does anyone know what that surah is? Think. Surah Mulk. Rasulullah said, whoever recites, It's one of the chapters in the Qur'an. It is known as Surah Mulk, right? Uh, and it, it defines the majesty, the power, the greatness of God, Allah, the Almighty. 
So this surah, this chapter in the Quran, there are 114 chapters. It's one of the chapters. When you go in the beginning, it says, The second verse is, For those brothers and sisters who are not Muslim and listening to, they can also understand this. A fine point to understand. And also, uh, and of course, all of us as youngsters and, and young adults to understand as well. The verse of the Quran says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةِ our Lord Almighty, God Almighty, created death and life to see which one of you will do the best of deeds. Now my question to you is, why has the death been mentioned before life? How can you die before you live? Because everything in the Quran is there because of a reason. Let me give you another example. Who here wants to be a doctor? All the kids and everything. Not me, my mom wants me to do it. Right? So you guys, you guys, okay. For many of you guys in the medical field, good. One, two, we got two doctors, all right. So look, I'll tell you one medical scientific rule. When the child is about to be born and Allah gives this child life, and the child is in the womb of the mother with this, subhanAllah, the most amazing way, the most beautiful way, the child is able to see and the child is, is able to hear. What do you think the child is able to do first? Hear or see? What do you think? Yes. Good. Amazing. The child is about to do, was that a guess? <laughs> kind of, okay, that makes sense. So the child in the womb of the mother is able to hear first and then the child is able to see. The reason is that the hearing of a child allows that child to have an equal aspect, meaning the equilibrium, the, 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 the aspect of keeping their head straight comes from the senses of proper hearing, not seeing. And this is, this is scientific, that a child is always able to hear first and then they're able to see. If you look at the Quran, the Qur'an always mentions, when talking about the creation of child, the Qur'an says, Sami'an Basira, the one who can hear and the one who can see. The Qur'an never says, the one who can see and the one, the one who can hear. Never. Why? Because that's the pattern of why things happen. So everything mentioned in the Qur'an is proportionally, perfectly placed in its position because of a reason. It's not there just why, because it's there. No. Have you ever thought about this? Who remembers Prophet Yusuf, Joseph? There's chapter number 12 in the Quran. Who remember, do you guys know that surah, right? Who knows Prophet Yusuf? You, know, you guys know Prophet Yusuf? The story of surah, uh, you know, Yusuf chapter 12, Prophet Joseph. It is mentioned that he saw a dream. Who remembers his dream? He saw, he says in the Quran, the Quran mentions he saw a dream. In his dream he says, I've seen 11 stars the sun and the moon. Do you guys remember that? That's like clicking any bells, right? I've seen, a st I've seen 11 stars, the sun and the moon. My question to you is, why did he say 11 stars, the sun and the moon? Why is this, this proportion like that? It's not small to big, big to small. Why is he juggling things around, right? Why is it said in that very particular order? Think about it. He could have said stars, the moon, and the sun, or the, the sun and the moon and the stars. But stars, the sun, and the moon, meaning like what's happening? Meaning that does not come from small to large or large to small. What's the reason? So ulama, the scholars of Islam have mentioned something so amazing. Everything is proportional in place for a reason. Because at the end of this chapter, we realize that this dream was actually an analogy, a metaphor, example. Of the 11 stars being the brothers, the sun being the father, the mother being the moon. And that's how they came upon him when he was in the kingdom of Egypt. He first saw the 11 stars, his brother. Then he saw the father, the sun. Then he saw the moon, the mother. Meaning he was perfectly placed in his position for a particular reason. So I go back to the reason of what I started off this topic with. Why does the Quran mention death before life? Does anyone know that? 
Because when a child is in the womb of the mother, our death, our destiny to live, for how long we will live, is decided before we even come on this world. We are meant to go before we even come. Imam al-Nabawi, who is a great scholar in Islam, in his kitab Arba'in al-Nabawi, in the fifth hadith, mentions that a child in the womb of the mother, four things are decided for him. One of the things is ajal. The time of demise of this child is written even before you come on this world. Which means that we are all meant to go, but brothers and sisters, what we will do in the life matters the most. Imam, um, the, the author of, uh, of Riyad al-Salihin, Imam al-Nawi rahmatullahi, was a man who never lived for a very long period of time. I mean, he lived for a small time. In 40s, he passed away. But the amount of work that he did is people in years are able to benefit from the work that he has done. Why? The maximizing of our time. So let's go back to where I began this topic from, guys. <coughs> Even though we're going to talk about knowledge and manners and piety, that's the important point. But being it into an interactive program is we really need to realize and understand the importance of Time first and foremost, because if you're if you're not able to manage your time properly, you're not able to do anything. And that's why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions in the ayah of the Quran, "One as inna li insanu la fi khus." He says, "By the time the humanity is in failure, except for those who have faith and do good deeds and invite towards good and appreciation upon the difficulties that come upon them." So he takes the oath and a promise of time in the Quran, and that's why, especially for the young people. I advise you that we really need to make sure that we maximize our time. Otherwise, the time is flying. The time is going so quickly that you won't even realize. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, a time will come near the day of Qiyamah, signs of Qiyamah, the day of judgment is, the years will pass like months, and months will pass like weeks, and weeks will pass like days. And that's what's happening. You started 2020 and it's the 11th day already, right? You're thinking, oh yes, the new year is going to start. It's 11 days and now you're going to say, oh, the one month passed already? It's going to go through very quickly. So as a believer, what do we need to do? We really need to make sure that we maximize our time. How do we maximize our time? We value our time. We need to be determined. We need to have the value of time in front of us to know what this time can bring for us. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sallam, would used to say that if I had my morning, I'm not sure if I would reach till the evening. Or if I had the evening, I'm not sure if I was going to reach till the morning. So making sure that we value our time to the max. Now let's get to the topic that was decided for us to speak for a few moments. I'm not going to get into a deeper con <coughs> conversation with that, but just overview of it. So guys, there are three things as youth I really feel are very important for us to work towards. And these things are one of the greatest, greatest assets for any individual or any human being. And one of them, of course, being knowledge itself. And what is ilm, right? What is knowledge? I ask you this question. Can someone tell me what ilm or knowledge actually means? What do you think knowledge means? What is ilm? What, what comes to your mind when you feel, when you think that someone is knowledgeable? Can I tell something or not? Of course, of course. To know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To know the deen. Okay. To know Allah to know the deen. What else? Just, just be open, guys. Don't worry about it. This is not a test. Yes. This person knows a lot. That's great. Okay, what else? That's amazing. A person who can differentiate and knows what is right and wrong. That's perfect. MashaAllah. What else? What 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 defines the word? Knowledge in our minds. Meaning, what is knowledge? How much you know. That's great. What else? Yes. He knows information and knows how to apply it. Great. So, a person who knows information and how to apply those things. That's great. What else? So, when we talk about knowledge, right, and we talk about this thing, there, there is a sense of persona in our mind of what knowledge is. One thing that we must make very, very clear in our mind is there is a difference between 
information and knowledge, right? That's one thing. There, there's a difference between information and knowledge. Uh, there is a difference between a skill and an Skill meaning you know something, you're able to do it really nicely, and one is to have the proper, proper knowledge behind it. So how does Islam define knowledge, right? What, what, how does Islam actually define the true knowledge? The true knowledge in Islam, the Quran defines as, and the Quran says, "Innama yabshallaha min ibadihi al ulama." That the true essence of knowledge is the consciousness of God. The true knowledge is the one who realizes the existence and presence of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala at every moment. God at every moment of their life, which means. It doesn't only have to be reading Quran and understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't only mean that you are in the masjid and you are pious and you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It could be a person studying science and they're seeing all of these different things and they say, you know what? There must be someone who created inside of human beings. The complex system of human beings and when you study in sun, and you're, you, it's nothing related to Quran or Hadith or anything like that. But you see the complex system of a human being and say, you know what? There must be someone who created insan, human being. You're looking at the entire global system and you're seeing the universe and you're seeing the things rising. You're seeing the sun and the moon and all the things around you. And you realize that there must be someone who created all these things, right? There must be someone who created all these things. So the reality of true knowledge is to know the existence of a creator behind all of this. You know, it, it boggles me sometimes and I'm just like, you know, moved that a lot of time we get into such deep conversations of how things come into existence, but we forget to think about the creator himself. Right? We think about the existence of creation but we forget to think about the Creator. Right? And that's why you see humanity discussing so much details about so many things, but they tend to forget that there must be someone else who created all of this. Ya Rab. There must be someone. When Prophet Ibrahim was speaking to his community, he would turn towards the star and the moon and the sun and he would say, look, all of these things are going away. And the one that never goes away is my Allah that exists and that is here forever. So. True knowledge is something that will make you recognize the existence of Allah, the Lord Almighty, in every place and every place. No matter where you are, you will be reminded of the existence of Allah at every point and every moment. I mentioned this story, I think, last year in Pathway to Jannah, but a reminder to the kids. There was a man who was sitting in a barber shop. And this person, while sitting in the barber shop, was getting his hair cut. And the man who was cutting the hair was a person who never believed in God. He never believed in God. And this person is saying all these crazy things about faith and belief and people dying because of hunger and women living in, in poverty and orphans and widows and seeing all these things and he's saying, how can it be possible that there is God? Well, there is so much bad and evil and wrong and this and that. He's saying all these bad things. So this person who is a Muslim is sitting down thinking, thinking, thinking. What am I going to tell this individual with all these objections that this person has brought? So he's keep on saying things that against now the Billah, the existence of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he kept on sitting there and listening to his words. After his hair was cut, everything was done this man walked outside of the barber shop. As soon as he walks outside of the barber shop, he's standing outside, he's holding his head. And he's saying, Oh Allah, Oh God Almighty, show me a path, show me a light that I can show this man that you exist. That there is God, there is Allah, there is the Almighty who's there, who's present, who's there for us, who provides for us, who nourishes us, who cherish, meaning who gives us everything. The complex system of this universe cannot function by its own self. 
If a boat cannot make its own self from pieces of wood, how do you feel that this entire universe functions in such a proper manner every single day and it's every single moment? So he says, Ya Rab, I, I, how can I show this man that you exist? So that he had this pain in his heart. So all of a sudden, while standing in front of the barber shop, he sees a man with very long hair. Very long hair. They're disheveled, they're everywhere. So he, he asks this man, can you please come inside the shop with me for two minutes? I just need you for two minutes. He said, okay, I'll come with you. So he goes inside with this man with very long hair, disheveled. They are all over the place. They are not groomed properly. This, this, the hair is all messed up. So he goes and he taps on the shoulder of that same barber who was saying, there's no God, there's nothing like that, there's all poverty, there's fear, there's death, there's this, that, all over the world. How can there be someone who is God? He's saying all this crazy stuff. So this man goes and he taps on the shoulder of the barber and he says, I got a news for you. He says, what's the news? He says, the news is that all the barber shops have closed and all the barbers have died. He goes, what? Seriously? You're standing in a barber shop, you're speaking to a barber, and you're telling me all the barber shops are closed and all the barber... That doesn't make sense. What are you saying? It doesn't make any sense. He says, okay, then you tell me, if there were barbers in this world and there were barber shops open, why would this guy's hair look like this? You tell me. He says, no, it's not about that. It's about this guy never going to the barber, right? It's about the guy never going to the barber. It's not about the barber shops not being there. So he said, look, that's my answer to you. It's, it's not about God being not there or Allah being not there. It is us that we don't come to God. It is Allah that it is us that we don't find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is true knowledge that brings us closer to Him. That is the true knowledge that brings our, our connection towards Him. So what is knowledge? Knowledge is something that everything around us reminds us of the existence of a supreme power that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is true in It could be medicine, it could be law, it could be mathematics, it could be chemistry, it could be deen, religion, Quran, sunnah, hadith, any of your religious studies, but anything that reminds you of the existence of Almighty Allah, that is your true Ali. And if something takes you away from Him, even though we may think that it's a religious thing, cannot be true Ali. True knowledge will always remind us of the existence of God. So, as, as I, I share this with you, and especially our youth who are sitting here, no matter what professions and fields you choose in your life, no matter what paths you want to take in your life, any path you want to take in your life, but don't forget to take the path of true knowledge as well, of knowing and finding your Creator. Because once you know Allah in your life, you have everything. And once you have Him with you, that means you have the understanding of the entire world because you have the understanding of God Himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's very, very important. And the second point related to your any brothers and sisters is our manners and our akhlaq. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Messenger of Allah, he himself mentioned, بُئِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَقِ From amongst the reasons of why God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Almighty has sent me, is to perfect character. From amongst the reasons of why I have been sent is to perfect character. Hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To perfect one's character is the reason why he came. I want to share one thing with you. My beloved teacher from Pakistan, he always tells us this. He says, look, the Prophet ﷺ would cry all night long. And the reason why he would cry was for the guidance of the humanity. People did not believe in God. People did not believe in Allah. People did not believe. So our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would cry for the guidance of these people. Morning and evening, he would cry for the people. He would wish for the guidance of people, right? That, uh, that was his thing. He cried so profusely, so much, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, revealed the verse of the Qur'an. Surah Kaf, chapter 18, it said, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِرُ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِن لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَادَ الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَ O oh my Nabi, would you give your life for the excessive amount of worry and, and crying that you have for the guidance of the people? Don't worry. 
if, if guidance is meant for them, they will get, but don't get yourself overdone and killed for the excessive crying and worry that you have for others. So when he cried for people, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord Almighty, tell them? Relax, that's too much. You can't do this much. A prophet used to stay awake the whole night. He used to pray for the whole night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, revealed the ayah of the Quran. And he said, that's too much. One third, one fourth, one half. Meaning, give some time to yourself. Rest up a little. You're doing too much, O oh my Nabi. O oh my Habib, it's too much. So remember these two things. When he cried so much for the guidance of the people, Allah said, it's too much. Don't cry that much, O oh my Prophet. When he stood awake the whole night praying, Allah said, that's too much. Don't do it, O oh my Prophet. Take some rest upon it. But when it came to his banner, and when he came to his akhlaq and his character, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقِ O Nabi, indeed, you are the most sublime and most perfect in your character. He never said you're too nice. Just relax. Don't be too nice. He never said. When he cried too much for the people, Allah said, you're doing too much. Just give some relaxation to yourself. When he prayed the whole night, he said, you're doing too much. You gotta relax. But when it came to his character, Allah never said, you're doing too much. Your akhlaq are too good. You can never be too good. right? That's why I was saying the quotation of some of the youngsters yesterday. I was quoting Aristotle. I'm not sure if I can quote him or not, but he said, he says, you are what you do repeatedly. You are what you do repeatedly. And then he mentions, which means excellence then is not an act, but a habit. He says, you are what you do repeatedly, every single day. You cannot be yourself if you do something once and that's it. You are what you do repeatedly. That's number one thing. Which means excellence is not a single act. You are nice one day and this is excellence. No. But excellence is a habit that you do every single day of your life. That's what excellence is. Excellence is not a single act. Excellence is a habit that you do every single day. And that's why Robert, Robert Pollard mentioned, he said, that good habits, once established, are as hard to leave as bad habits. A lot of times we say, you know what, these bad habits are not leaving me. Good habits, once established, are as hard to leave as bad habits. But we just need to create those good habits. The good manners, the good akhlaq must be created within our own selves. So going back to what I had mentioned, that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has mentioned in the Quran, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ For indeed you have the most sublime character. I remember our teacher, Mawadari Jameel Sabdawat Barakatuh, mentioned once, he said, one of our teachers, he said, and this is not a hadith, this is not a Quran, but this is something that he gave as an example. He said, if you look towards the roads or highways that lead you towards Jannah, there are multiple highways that lead you to Jannah. There are certain people who are packed on the highway of praying. MashaAllah, you find them in long rakats of salah and prayers in the middle of the night and ishraq, nawabin, and that's beautiful. May Allah give us the ability to be amongst one of those individuals. But he said that that, that highway is pretty packed with people doing it. He said that you look at the people with fasting, siyam, and mashallah, it's packed. People are fasting Mondays and Thursdays and 13th, 14th, and 15th of the Islamic white calendar days. Meaning people are mashallah doing all these things. And he says, the highway is pretty packed. Then you have people mashallah going for hajj and umrah excessively. And you see that highway pretty packed at all times. So he says, if you look at prayers and you look at charity and you look at fasting and you look at hajj, all of these highways look pretty packed. But he says that you look at one highway and it's completely empty. And that is the highway of akhlaq, your character and your manner. He says you look at that highway towards Jannah, it's almost empty. Why? Because you will find people with lots of salah and lots of hajj and lots of sadaqah. But when it comes to manners and akhlaq, it's nothing. 
akhlaq, it matters in what makes someone beautiful. That's why Rasulullah talked about their greatest character. He says, what are the two things that will lead most people to Jannah? One is the consciousness of Allah, taqwa of Allah, the fear of Allah, the love of Allah. I don't even translate taqwa as the fear of God. I say the love of God, the consciousness of God, the presence of the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one thing that leads most people to paradise is consciousness of God. You know He's watching. You know He's present. And number two is good manners. Good manners. You can never have enough good manners. You can always increase in having better manners. Better manners. And that was the work of Rasulullah And the Prophet said, should I not tell you the best of the manners for those who came before you and those who will come after you? The Prophet said, do you not want to learn the best of the manners for those who came before you and those who will come after you? The Sahaba said, please tell us. The Prophet says, do three things. And especially for our youth and our adults, we, I ask you to take these three things back with you. The Prophet said, do three things. You will have the best of the akhlaq and the manners of those who came before you and those who come after you. The Prophet said, Silman qata'at wa fu'amman dhalamak Three things the Nabi of Allah Sallallahu said. Number one, those who cut with you, you join ties with them. Silman kata'at. Join with those who cut ties with you. It's easy to say salam to a person who says salam to you. But it's very hard to say salam to a person who will turn their face away from you. Say salam. Join relationships. Silman kata'at. Those who cut, join with them. Number one step of akhlaq, our Nabi mentioned, mannerism, your manner. Join with those who cut ties with you. Silman kata'at, wa'fu amman dhalamak. Forgive those who have done dhulm upon you. Those who have done the worst, learn to forgive them. Wa'ahsan ila man asailik. And this is the climax of akhlaq and manners. And treat the ones in the best manner the ones who have who may have treated you in the worst of the times. What ahsan ilaman asahik. Meaning those who may have treated you in the worst of the ways, you treat in, in return in the best of the manner. And I tell this to the youth all the time. I say become a pencil. You know number two pencils? You guys see number two pencils, right? Who see the number two pencil? Come on guys, you guys all see the number two pencil. So if you ever seen a pencil, what does a pencil do? Whenever the pencil writes the pencil never discriminates. It doesn't say, I, I'm going to write better on, on a paper than a rock or something else. It just does its job. The pencil never judges its surface. It just does its job. And that's what a pencil does, is that it makes sure that it does not, you know, uh, differentiates between the surface itself. And that's what a true believer is, brothers and sisters. Our manners and our akhlaq, like the akhlaq and the manners of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. So mannerism, Mannerism is something that will lead a person towards such levels that we cannot even imagine. And Sahaba radiallahu anhu majmain, and of course we learn from the life that Rasulullah's akhlaq and manner were such that the Quran itself was the life of the Prophet Muhammad. The practical Quran were the mannerism of the Prophet Muhammad. And with mannerism, brothers and sisters, what is mannerism? What is akhlaq? What is manner? What is this, this reality, the characteristics? And, and, and one thing, brothers and sisters, is that we need to work so much on our akhlaq that it should become a part of our life. It, it should become a second nature to us. It is mentioned that uh, when Sheikh Qasim Danotwi, rahmatullahi, who was a great scholar of his time, who was the founder of one of the largest institutions of the Oban in India, when Qasim Danotwi, rahmatullahi, had sent, spent some time in the company of a sheikh in Mecca and many months and when he came back the sheikh wrote to him his own student and he asked him that what has the feeling of yours been ever since you left Mecca and you left you know the Haramain and you have gone back to your own institution you are teaching learning mashallah what has been your condition meaning share your inner feelings with your teacher of how you feel so the student wrote back to the teacher and said something so amazing. He said, ever since leaving your company, sunnah has become an adat for me. Meaning, 
Sunnah has become a second nature for me. I can't just drink anything with left hand anymore. Meaning I, it doesn't go to my mouth. It feels awkward. Meaning whenever I come to the masjid, my, my foot doesn't get inside unless it's the right foot. I can't enter the masjid with my left foot. It doesn't feel, it doesn't allow me. And it's so hard for me to put a morsel in my mouth with left hand. Meaning it's always the right thing. And it's impossible for me to stand up and drink because it doesn't feel right for me. Meaning everything which is sunnah has become a second nature for me. Meaning it has become such a part of my life that I cannot go against the sunnah anymore. Same way, brothers and sisters, we work so much on our akhlaq and mannerism that good manners become a part of our life. That we don't have to try to change, but manners and akhlaq are part of our lives. And what is mannerism? What is, what is akhlaq? that we continuously go back to the life of the Prophet Muhammad The manners of the Prophet related to the adults. The manners of the Prophet related to children. Meaning there were manners for all sides. The Nabi of Allah words and advice to young people of how to have manners with the adults while telling a Sahabi, never walk in front of your father, never sit before him, never call him by, your, by his name. And remember the goodness inside of him, meaning always pray for him the way that he taught manner related to adults. And then he, he, taught, he taught the youth, the, young, the adults, the manners of the children as well. The adab and the etiquettes related to children. Anas radiallahu said, I lived with the Rasulullah for 10 years as a, sir, as a person who served him day in and day out. I would put the water for him, I would put the miswak for him for 10 years. And he said, I was a young kid from 8 to 18. He said, I was a young kid and I would make a lot of foolish mistakes. He says, 10 years, he said, I take the promise of Allah. 10 years, I stayed with the Prophet and he never cursed me once. He never screamed at me once. And he never told me, why are you doing this like this? Not even once for 10 years. Mannerism with adults, mannerism with children. Manners with the wives at home. The Prophet Muhammad said, for, the, for those who are married and sitting here as adults, even though this is our youth session, but the Prophet said, the best men amongst you are the ones whose wives say that he has the best manners. That's what Rasulullah said. It's easy to show akhlaq to people outside, but to give akhlaq to a person who gives all of their life to you, that's what akhlaq and manners is. If someone's wife can guarantee that my husband is a good person of good character, wallahi, you are a man of good character. That's what our Nabi, the Prophet Muhammad said. Khayrukum, khayrukum li ahli. The best of you are those who are the best to their wives and their families. And then the Nabi of Allah said, I'm the best to my family, as, as the words of the Prophet. And this, this was the advice of the Prophet, telling the women folk, that the men, that this is the mannerism when it comes to family themselves, when it comes to community, when it comes to neighbors, the Prophet said, do you know who will be the first two people to stand face to face on the day of Qiyamah? Two people standing face to face in front of each other, asking for each other's right? The Sahaba, the Prophet asked the Sahaba, do you know who will be the two first individuals lining up in front of each other on the day of Qiyamah? The Sahaba said, we don't know. The Prophet said they would be two neighbors, Osman. There were two neighbors who would stand in front of each other asking for it. So the rights and the mannerism of our neighbors, all of these add up to the akhlaq and the manners of the Prophet. And when mannerism comes in anything, it just beautifies the brothers and sisters. Manners and akhlaq, manners and akhlaq, characteristics must be developed in our life. And last but not least, the third portion of it before I finish in just a few moments. Brothers and sisters, is piety. That none of these things can ever be in our life till there is consciousness of God. There is awareness of Allah in our life, the Almighty. Otherwise, all of these things will remain as words. We will leave these gatherings and everything will go away with us. It will not be sustainable. It will not retain in our lives till we have piety and taqwa and consciousness of the Almighty within our own hearts. And that's what we need to develop in our hearts. We need to develop that, that, that awareness, <coughs> not only 
the fear, but the love of Allah so much that we can't do wrong. You must have heard the story in the time of Umar radiallahu anhu. And who knows Umar? Who knows Umar radiallahu anhu? Right? You know Umar radiallahu guys? Come on, guys. He's one of the Khalifas of Islam, one of the successors after Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. When Umar radiallahu anhu took over, the Prophet ﷺ passed away at the age of 63. Abu Bakr who came in. He stayed for two years and three months and ten days. He passed away at the age of 63 as well. Umar who came in. He stayed as a Khalifa, as, as, as Abil Mu'mineen, the leader of the Muslims, for ten years and approximately six months. In the time of his Khilafah, Islam grew far distance in far places. To approximately 2.2 square million miles and far distances. And at that time, Umar and, and, and talking about piety and taqwa and, and, and consciousness in our life, what did Umar used to say? Umar would very often say that I wish I was a bird and, and, and that lived and flew and never had to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of day. I wish I was a hair on a, on, a, on, on a body of a believer that was just there and went away and never never had to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So piety and consciousness of Allah must be developed in our hearts. Taqwa and piety is something that needs to be developed within the roots of our hearts, knowing that Allah is watching. Allah is there with us at all times. And if you remember the famous story that Umar who used to patrol the streets of Medina. As he was the governor, he was the leader, he would patrol the streets. And one day while he was walking in front of a house, he heard this conversation between a mother and a daughter. And the mother, to test the daughter, is saying, Oh my daughter, why don't you put some water inside the milk where it will become abundant and we can make more money off of it. So at this moment, the mother when she's testing the daughter that what she would say, the daughter replies and says, Oh my mother, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar anhu, our leader has told us that we cannot do this act. So to test the daughter, the mother says, but Umar is not watching us. But Umar is not here. So at this moment, the girl says, but the Lord of Umar is watching. But the Rabb of Umar is there. If Umar is not watching me, then where is Allah who is watching? So Umar radiallahu put a mark in front of his house, this house. And the next day Umar radiallahu came with his son Asim. And he married his son to that girl. And from the progeny of that girl and the son of Umar radiallahu, a man came to this world known as Umar bin Abdul Aziz. From the progeny of that very girl, that very woman. So piety and consciousness of God will remain in the lives of the progeny and generations of human beings. Consciousness of Allah. Sahaba radiallahu majma'in mentioned that one day while we were traveling to the outskirts of Medina, we saw a, a Bedouin, a Baddu, a villager. And this person was grazing the, the, the animals, the goats. So while we were traveling, so we asked this individual, that can you get us one of the sheep and the goats? So he says, it's not mine. It's, it's, it's my owner's. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm just a shepherd. I just take these. And he was a Muslim. He's a believer. So he said, I'm just a shepherd. I'm, I'm just working for someone. And I, I take the sheep around. And I, and I herd them. And, and I take care of it. And I get money off of it. These sheep are not mine. That I can sell you one. <coughs> so to test this individual... The Sahaba said, we asked this Bedouin, and we asked this individual who was a Sahabi himself as well, that why don't you tell your owner when you go back that a wolf came and ate one of the sheep, and you can take the money and you can keep it for yourself, and you can give it to us. He would never know that, that the sheep came and was eaten by the wolf. And you can keep the money and he would never even find out because he's not even here. So the Sahaba said, we were amazed by the answer of this man. And this man said, فَأَيْنَ Allah." Then where, will it, where, then where is my Allah? He says, I can fake it to my boss. I can fake it to anyone I want. But where is my Allah? So the Sahaba said, when we were walking back from the Bedouin, and we were walking back towards our homes, 
we would keep on saying, Fa'ain Allah, Fa'ain Allah. A Bedouin said, Fa'ain Allah. Where is my Allah? Where is my Allah? At the time of Umar anhu, before I finish, he sent a caravan, a group of individuals by the name of one leader named known as Abdullah bin Khudafa <clears throat> This group of individuals were sent up towards the northern parts. Umar anhu's time Muslims had spread far distance. 22 provinces. They reached an area which was controlled by a Christian king. They got hold of the entire envoy of the Muslims. When they got hold of the entire Muslims, they asked for the leader of the Muslims. So it was told that he is Abdullah bin Qudafa. He is one of the good companions and great companions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So the Christian king, he brought in Abdullah bin Qudafa. And he said, I have a deal for you. That you accept my faith, you let go of Islam, and I'll give you half of my kingdom and whatever you choose within it, it's yours, and let's make a deal like this. So Abdullah bin Qudafa said, if you give me your entire kingdom and you ask me to leave my faith even for a blink of an eye, I won't do it. Then he asked, that man asked, the king asked, if you were to exchange this place with your master Muhammad, peace be upon him, would you take it? He said, even if my Prophet was sitting comfortably in his house, I would not even want a thorn to even prick him even the slightest bit while I'm enjoying comfort. Meaning, not even this much I would allow it. So the king knew that this man is not going to move that easy. I'm talking about piety, taqwa, the consciousness. So at this moment, uh, you know, the king said, you know what, let's try another way. So he takes the most beautiful of the women and he puts Abdullah bin Khudafa in the room. He puts this woman inside and he, she's adorned in the most beautiful of her clothing in the best way that she can. And she goes inside a closed door where this young man, Abdullah bin Khudafa, is sitting. And after a few seconds, this woman screams and she runs out. So they say, you know, the work is done. He got caught in the entire act and this and that. And this woman comes screaming outside and she says, is this man a human or this man a stone, a rock? For indeed, I promise you, he will not be able to let you know that if I'm a human or if I'm not a human because he never even lifted an eye upon me to see who came inside. I mean, this is a young man captured inside a room. No one is there to ask him questions for anything that he does. And the woman screams and she says, <coughs> is he a bashar or hajar? Is he a human or rock? Meaning he has no feelings? What happened to this man? That he did not even look up to see who he is. The king says, we need to intimidate him in another way. So he brings two of his companions and brings in oil and he throws his two companions inside and within seconds, his two companions are finished and killed in his eyes. Now it's choice for Abdullah bin Khudafa. They kept on throwing arrows at him while they put him next to a wall without hitting him that maybe he'll get intimidated with death, but nothing happened. Finally, they were taking him towards the fire, the oil about to throw him inside, and Abdullah bin Khudafa began to cry. And he cried very profusely, he cried a lot. So now the king knew that this guy has melted down with all these things. Now he's going to finally give up and he's going to be okay. To, of all the conditions we want to place upon him. So when they brought Abdullah bin Hudafa, they asked him, Why are you crying? Are you like able to like negotiate everything with us? Leave your faith? So Abdullah bin Hudafa said something interesting, which I will finish with. He said, I'm just crying over the feelings that my Allah is asking me to present my life for Him. And when the time came to give my life, I only have one life. And I will be thrown inside the oil and I will be burnt and I will be done in seconds. I wish I had lives as much as the hair on my body and one after the other I can give for my Allah. I'm just crying that, oh Allah, you only gave me one life. And when you ask of me for something, I can only give it once. I wish I had as lives as much as my hair and my body, that, oh Allah, I'll give my life again and again and again for your sake, oh Allah. 
Brothers and sisters, what allowed these individuals to make these decisions was piety and taqwa. It wasn't a camera. It wasn't surveillance. It wasn't someone watching or hearing him that I'm going to keep a watch on you. No. It was the feeling that my Allah is with me. It is Allah who is present with me. And wallahi, especially for our youth, and I'll finish with this. <coughs> Inshallah, if you keep this feeling in your hearts, that Allah is with me and He is watching with me, no matter where you reach in your life, you will be successful. No matter where you, re you end up in your life and in the, in the professions and the manners of your life, you will be successful as long as you have the consciousness of Allah. So three things to acquire in your life. Knowledge that will bring you close to your almighty Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Manners that will change the hearts of humanity. And consciousness and piety in our hearts that will always allow us to do what is correct. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to do what is correct and right in our lives. Allow us to live our life according to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu And may He give us the ability to live our life as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be, will, will be pleased with us. Jazakumullah khairun wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.